it is that time again. Wednesday, 1 p.m. I have a very, very intriguing guest with me today. Uh, he is Lewis Skinner, uh, one of the uh, winemakers in Washington. Wakes wine for uh, Betts Family Winery. Uh, very, very talented uh, young winemaker. Uh, very, uh, very ambitious. Very geeky. We're gonna get, we're gonna get geeky today. It's gonna be fun. Let's see if we can find him. Joining. <laughs> there he is. How are you, sir? Hey. How you doing? Very well. Yourself? I'm doing great. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for spending your uh, Wednesday afternoon with me. Uh, first off, um, uh, could you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to everyone and uh, give us a quick background about yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. My name's uh, Lewis Skinner. I'm the winemaker here at uh, Betts Family Winery in Woodenville, Washington, Washington State. And, uh, you know, I first started working with uh, Bob Betts, uh, MW, back in uh, Harvest 2010. At the time, I was a student at a local enology viticulture program at uh, South Seattle Community College, and I needed a, a harvest kind of to, to finish up my degree there. And uh, for a couple of seasons, I had been wanting to call uh, Betts my my first official uh, spot in the wine industry, and and that kind of that came to life, and so that's that was kind of my beginning um, at Betts Family Winery, nice. and yeah, so you know, kind of leading up to that, you know, just talking a little bit about myself and how I I, I came to be in the wine industry, um, a friend of mine, uh, geez, 15, 17 years ago, um, a, a gentleman that I've become good friends with, he. He had kind of hounded me after about a year of uh, going over to his house frequently for dinner with my wife saying, hey, you never drink any of the wine we put out. Why is that? And I was like, nah, I'm not really big on wine. I don't, I don't really like wine at all. And yeah. obviously he's, he says that that's kind of ridiculous. Like you're going <laughs> to come over to my house this weekend and I'm going I'm to teach you about wine. And so, uh, you know, my, my relationship with wine wasn't this slow thing where I started appreciating it over decades. Um, it was kind of an overnight thing, which... Uh, uh, it, it's kind of interesting if you think about it. So uh, he, he invited me over to his home. We had about eight bottles of wine, some Burgundy, some Bordeaux, some Napa Valley Cabernet, a, a list of wine, some Chateauneuf de Pop. And uh, it really blew me away. It made an impression on me. Uh, the next morning, I kind of woke up thinking about wine and it was like that. So I remember literally the next day walking into just a grocery store to, to shop for dinner. And just yeah. I, I kind of walked by the wine aisle and I paused and I kind of backed up. And I was like, wow, there's a whole, there's a whole aisle of wine, you know, at, at the grocery store dedicated <laughs> on it. I had spent my whole life kind of walking by it. Like it might as well have been uh, laundry soap to me. Like I just literally had no interest in wine, you know, for, for what that's worth. And so um, that kind of, that kind of started my, that was a little bit of an inflection point in my life. I started really uh, digging into wine at that point uh, about uh, in, any books I could find in the library at the time, not online, but uh, you know, I was I was shopping a lot for wine books, and I and I really dug in, and it wasn't too long before I realized I wanted to uh, I wanted to be in the wine industry. I didn't know at what capacity yet, but analogy interested me quite a bit. I think I read uh, Emil Pinot's Knowing and Making Wine like in the first month. I even discovered wine, so I think it, oh. that that technical aspect of wine making <laughs> uh, appealed to me quite a bit. But for sure, kind of fast forwarding. Um, I went to the South Seattle program for a couple seasons, um, mm -hmm. 2000, and uh, I was class of 2008 there. And um, at the same time, I was working at a wine shop, a local wine shop in Redmond, Washington. And so I had this really kind of, uh, it was an interesting time just in the world. You know, the economy had been a little rough about that time. And so I think there was a lot of people out on the road kind of supporting their wines around that, that, that period of time. And so I had this <laughs> unique opportunity to be working retail sales for, I guess, three and a half years, you know, studying enology. Um, it, it gave me a really kind of an interesting uh, way to kind of spend my days uh, reading about wine, studying wine at school, and then in the evenings, the mornings, the weekends, kind of getting to uh, make sense of that by getting to taste a lot of wine. And so it, <laughs> it, it, it shaped me quite a bit. And so uh, that's how I met Bob Betts. That's how I met Chris Upchurch. That was my first job in, uh, after, after Betts, that harvest in 2010, I went to work for DeLille for a few seasons mm -hmm. and uh, came back. There was an opportunity in 2014 to come back to Betts and I, and I happily uh, agreed to come back and 
So I've been uh, kind of working under Bob and then kind of took over as a winemaker or we still work together, but uh, it's kind of, it's kind of transition to, I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the tip of the spear um, at this point in time. I kind of drive uh, the directions that we go in, but Bob is always kind of a, a guiding light in what we do. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So how is it, uh, how is it working with, with Bob Betts? I mean, he's such a mentor to so many and yeah, uh, a man who's so gentle and soft-spoken, but so knowledgeable and he's, you know, he's, he's kind of an icon for, for Washington. Yeah, agreed. No, you know, uh, every day, especially I think lately too, I think we've all been kind of reflecting on the world and our lives and, and, and things like that. And I, every day I wake up lately too, and I'm just, I realize how fortunate I am to uh, get to go to work at Vets every day and work with Bob <laughs> and Steve and Bridget and my team and, and all the people, you, all the people I interact with, the, the customers. Uh, but, but Bob in particular, it, it's been great. You know, I think uh, the interesting thing before I knew Bob well, like just kind of looking at him for a distance from a distance, um, you kind of see somebody who's well-spoken and very knowledgeable. He's a master of wine. But then, you know, starting in 2010, when I really got to a chance to know him, I realized like of all the people in the wine industry I've met in my life, he probably uh, appreciates uh, everyone's opinion uh, more than you would expect. I remember Bob would just sit for hours with any consumer. Like he was so genuinely interested in hearing their opinion of the wines, their feedback, their experience yeah. with, with wine tasting, or just what their view of wine is. And I think that's kind of an unusual thing um, just in the world, maybe, maybe in the wine industry. I'm not sure. Certainly there's lots of inquisitive people in the wine industry, but I think uh, that was one thing that struck me about Bob is just, he, he always took the time to get, uh, you know, anybody and everybody's perspective on his wines and, and just the, the wine industry. So, um, you know, I think of all the, all the winemakers that I've met in my life, the traveling I've done, and certainly the wines that I appreciate the most, you know, when I, when I look at the impact of those, that how they influence me and my perception of them, I think Bob's probably shaped my view of winemaking or my, oh, geez, my philosophies about winemaking, uh, probably more than any other person in the wine industry. I mean, of course, I've, I've worked uh, with him, around him for a decade, but I think um, that first harvest that I got to work with him in 2010, I think it, it really, it, it shaped me probably more than any other experience. And just, I saw how, how much precision he had in winemaking, like how much he valued every, every piece of data. And I don't mean to sound data like in a cold way, every, everything he could record and capture, um, he would. And, and, yeah. and it, it didn't take me long to kind of figure out like how powerful that was stuff that I, <laughs> that I, I knew about and I knew people collected it and had an interest in it. But Bob was just kind of to the, to the 10th degree on all that stuff. It was like, what were the berry weights on this lot of Cabernet last year? He was really interesting. Like, how is that going to affect our fermentations? I'm just giving you one kind of one idea of what it is. I mean, there's many things, fermentation temperatures and when did we pick this lot? And it's some of that, I guess that stuff that you would almost consider kind of like baseline or rudimentary stuff. Like Bob was always so interested in it. And kind of uh, going back over it and assessing it and kind of trying to make sense of uh, it in that season, that, that, the, the data, and then in, in future seasons. And I, I realized pretty quick, like, how, how powerful that was, that kind of that, I guess, Bob's, I guess if Bob had a mantra in the wine industry or in life, it's probably, it's probably cause and effect. Like, he's always been so genuinely interested in, in cause and effect. I mean, I'm sure in, in lots of things in the world, but in particular, winemaking, it's something that's... Sure think really really driven him to always uh want to be inquisitive and uh always look for a, a better vantage point if you will yeah for sure that's one thing i've always uh was one of the first things i noticed about uh, about bob is he's very thoughtful about what he says what he does and the intention um that he made with his wines and now that you're making with with the best family wines they're just you, you can see exactly what what the profile will be what what the wine will be you can you can you find find its essence uh very easily uh where some wines you've got to search for them and you know, there's like you said a precision to them and it's all calculated um and coming from a science background myself and you know math science mm -hmm. um having all that data is is crucial you know i i love to uh, look at the uh, farmer's almanac uh, mm -hmm. on different areas and you know, look at why certain things happen a certain way. And remember when you, uh, you were last uh, at uh, the Wine Advocate office, we talked about how you could start to kind of predict how much, um, how much wine you would actually end up harvesting because you could 
you know, think about, you know, you're getting X clusters per yep. per shoot, and then you could figure out roughly it's going to be X month, number of gallons per acre, and then figure yeah. out within within a, you know, a small degree of error, uh, pretty much what your entire bottling will be before you've even crushed anything, which is yeah. really, really an, an, a, a powerful thing to, to do. Yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a big uh, quality driver for us. I mean, and that's a good that's a good example of something that's um, I guess I would say just as a company, that's that's newer for us over the last few seasons, kind of really uh, trying to. Well, we've, we've always been trying to get closer and closer to farming because it is a challenge, you know, where we're located on the, uh, yeah. the, the western side of the Cascade Mountain Range versus folks that are actually stationed out there. I think you, you and I had this discussion, I think. 10 years ago, I <coughs> asked me, I probably would have naively said, yeah, you know, that's, it, it's, it's about the same, but obviously uh, a decade later, I know that it, it, it's definitely a challenge to uh, have the same, the same eyes on it, hands on it, really understand the, the conditions of any given harvest, the pace that the fruit's ripening. I mean, all those things, um, wanting to better understand those and better, get, a, get a better view of those has really driven us to be um, in the vineyard more and more uh, every season. And, and like you said, this last season, 2019 for us was a, a, a pretty uh, challenging year as far as uh, Washington vintages go. We had a, yeah. a, a late season snow and the snow melted off and the season kind of started late and uh, a little bit, a lot of cool weather really. And so uh, it, it, was, it was critical for us. I think it really helped us, uh, helped us shine in that really challenging vintage. Uh, uh, it, it just uh, continually reaffirms uh, what I think about Bob's, uh, his philosophy of collecting data and always trying to uh, understand what, what's going on in front of us. I'm sure it's a very smart thing. So uh, uh, much of the world may not uh, realize that uh, Betts has new owners. Uh, can you speak to us briefly about um, uh, where the, uh, what, what the owners have intended for, for the brand and where the brand is headed? Sure, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I guess I showed up at Betts, like I said, Harvest 2010 during kind of in a really interesting period because at that time, Bob still owned the winery. Um, little did I know, you know, Steve and Bridget had come around during Harvest and worked a little bit of Harvest with us. But as far as I knew, they were uh, friends of Bob's and they were visiting from out of town. And, and, and that was kind of that. And then uh, a few months later, or I guess the beginning of 2011, Steve and Bridget uh, bought the winery. And you could imagine, you know, in a in a small, well, you know, uh, in the winemaking community in Woodinville in Washington State, it was pretty big news. You know, a lot, everybody was like, wow, what's going to happen with Beth's Winery? And, you know, Bob kept it pretty, pretty, pretty close. I don't think anybody really knew uh, that Beth's Family Winery could be uh, changing hands. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a secret up until the point they announced it. So it was pretty big news. But, you know, everybody was kind of holding their breath saying, wow, what, what are Steve and Bridget going to do with Beth's Winery? But, uh, <laughs> they have done nothing but try to to push on everything we do and that's kind of the, the term i use when i'm talking about trying to improve quality is is really everything we do they have done everything that they can do to help bob to help me our team the winery um really make better wine and and that's not always the case i think when you have uh new ownership and and for somebody you know and that's coming from me that's just my honest from the heart I'm pretty passionate about wine. I live and breathe wine every day. And uh, Steve and Bridget Griesel, who own the winery, they are uh, they're about as uh, dedicated as folks can be to, uh, to wanting the winery to, to succeed and to really putting us in the best position, which makes me feel really lucky as well to get to work with Bob and then to have Steve and Bridget involved too and to be that passionate about it. And, and I guess that, that's, that, that's a common theme at Betts. And that's another reason why I think every morning I, I, I try to remind myself like, wow, like the team we have, the people that are involved in the winery, this won't be the experience at every place I work in my whole lifetime. I mean, I could be at Betts for another year. I could be here for 30 years, but point being the team we have is really cool. And I try to appreciate that uh, every day because we're always trying to push each other to do better, uh, find better ways to do things. Um, what, you know, what are the, what are the hurdles we have for quality or, um, how can we make our, our relationships with, uh, with people better or growers or distributors, or we're always trying to push each other to do better in that kind of, uh, in those categories. So that, I think that's something pretty special. For sure. Yeah. I was, uh, kind of surprised that, um, when I came to visit last year at the, uh, at the winery that, uh, you had the, uh, um, uh, Quinta Essencia, uh, Chenin Blanc from South Africa, and because they also own that uh, that property as well in South Africa, and 
since yeah. I review Washington and South Africa. I was like, sure, absolutely, let's do this. I'm gonna switch gears over to South Africa for a second and switch back to yeah. Washington. But it was, it was really cool to, to see that uh, side by side. Speaking of wine, uh, we've got some wines to try. We've got, uh, you've selected three bottles, uh, all 2016 vintage. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead and get into the very first bottle for today. This is yes. the 2016 Betts uh, Paired de Family. Uh, go ahead and uh, speak briefly why you decided to choose this bottling uh, to, uh, to be uh, tasted today. Yeah, so um, <laughs> the reason I chose uh, Pair de Famille to kind of to start this uh, tasting with, you know, it's, it's the, you know, maybe it's the catalyst, it's the beginning, it's the genesis of, uh, of Best Family Winery. Uh, Bob started uh, making Cabernet in, in 1997, though, you know, he had been in the Washington wine industry, uh, you know, originally working for Chateau St. Michel in 1975. So um, I, I say that's the beginning in 1997, but Bob had uh, pretty, a, a pretty unique uh, vantage point <laughs> since 1975, kind of watching the industry, uh, you know, evolve from something quite small that no one really knew about to, to what it was in 97 when he started and then to what it, it is today. We have a, a thousand wineries in the state. And, so he, he's really seen, uh, seen a really interesting period of Washington. I mean, the, the modern era of Washington State, like he's kind of seen, um, he, he's, he's seen it evolve. He's seen, he, he's seen the creation of it, which is really neat. But Père de Famille, getting back to Père de Famille, um, Père de Famille, father of the family, <coughs> is what it means. And we, again, 2016, it's our 20th vintage of it. So 97 was our first, 2016 is our 20th vintage. Um, I think for me, it, it's kind of a special wine. I like to show off the 2016 vintage, especially right now, kind of the way that it's drinking in Washington state, because I, I think it shows off some of the best of Washington, what Washington has and can achieve, which is it's a year where we had um, a lot of heat in the beginning and it kind of slowly tapered off to where we had this kind of a, a below average heat accumulation in the end anyhow. And the fruit came in, in um, for lack of a better word, uh, perfect or really good condition we'll say like it just it looked just spectacular i haven't seen any other fruit in washington come in in another season that was just so clean um the grape skins in 2016 particularly in like in cabernet sauvignon um they were a little thinner so i think we we achieved a texture um probably more so because of the influence of the vintage maybe than anything winemaking to be completely honest i i think it's a it's a something i see in other wines in washington state particularly cabernet sauvignon based wines but um, 2016, I think it offers a lot of generosity now, and it's kind of one of those vintages where I, I feel like looking at it, it, it really kind of shows the best of, of Washington. It, it, that's in my perspective for, for, for Cabernet Sauvignon. But compared to for me, that's what Bob believed in um, after, you know, at that point, 22 years in the Washington wines industry. He really believed that um, Cabernet Sauvignon was something that could um, kind of stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, maybe a lot of the greatest uh, Cabernets produced in, in the world. Uh, if not, you know, maybe different stylistically. And I think Washington is always, uh, I guess, continually trying to move forward stylistically and say, okay, this is what Washington Cabernet Sauvignon is supposed to be. This is what Washington Syrah is supposed to be. But um, it, it's, it's probably our most powerful tool, I think, to kind of show off Washington, Pair de Famias, and kind of show off the vintage. And there's actually a lot of vintage diversity in Washington. I think a lot of people um, either have heard or they assume, okay, Washington's pretty dry. We get five or 10 inches of rain. We're on the eastern side of the Cascade Mountains. It's semi-desert. And so they assume like it's warm and dry there. Every year is about the same. It's always successful. But in reality, we get a lot of vintage diversity. And, I, and it's something that uh, I guess I pay more attention to it than ever before. I think one thing that Bob's always been known for, that's Pair de Famille, um, has always been a, a pretty consistent wine, I like to think. People think, wow, qualitatively, it reaches a, a pretty high point qualitatively every year. So I think like the best that we can do with it, um, you know, right now moving forward is to hopefully show off the vintage with it. And so it's always going to be um, labeled Columbia Valley because we, we, we do focus a lot on the Yakima Valley in Washington State, that 75 mile valley that's east west orientation but we will pull fruit from walla walla the horse seven hills a lot of times it's going to be predominantly yakima valley fruit but we always want to uh leave the door open to where if like wow walla walla really kind of fit our profile this year with merlot or cabernet or the horse seven hills cabernet it just really fit our profile this year so we're we'll leave a lot of flexibility there and and i guess another reason i chose paired for me to start with is we probably spend half of our time for all the wines that we make, we probably spend half of our time kind of, uh, you know, 
working with the growers, farming the grapes, uh, fermenting all the cuvées, meticulously going through all the barrels, you know, sensory tasting wise, yeah. and, and putting the wine together, the blend. I mean, we probably, there's sometimes we go through the alphabet a couple of times just in blind tasting blends to kind of, <laughs> to find the blend that we feel really kind of shows what Pair de Fumi is supposed to be. So then in speaking about trying to find the blend, what, what do you look for in doing all these barrel tastings to try and find what the wine will ultimately become? That's a very good question. You know, um, I think uh, not unlike a lot of other wineries, we, I think Betts has a pretty, a pretty clear house style. I think Bob's always, uh, especially in the beginning, always wanted a, a, a Cabernet that really spoke of the great Cabernet Sauvignon, um, really um, had some power to it. The classic, the, the herbs, the thyme, the bay, uh, the currant, the cassie, and I, and I think that that had always been, um, I think those had been the, the, the prominent sensory characters Bob had always been looking for. Of course, there's a lot more. I'm just talking, I'm, I'm throwing out a, a few descriptors. I think as time has gone by, we've changed, Bob's changed. I think that we're trying to find, I think we're always looking for that balance where we're trying to say, okay, power is out here, freshness is out here. Where is that midpoint that we can find where we're kind of trying to balance all those things? Because it's not incredibly difficult to make a really big wine. You, I think you and I had this discussion. It's not, yeah. not to knock at anybody's winemaking style because I love the diversity of wine in the world, but I think that there's a lot of situations in winemaking where you could say, okay, I could get this really ripe. I could make it 15% alcohol, all these things. Um, to take nothing away from those, but I think that it, it's more difficult to find freshness and balance and, and find some nice point between um, power and freshness. And so that's my kind of best way of, of describing it is I think that we, we seek that more now than we ever have. But I don't think that we're alone in that. I think there's so many people in the wine world that are probably, they might define it a little different than I'm describing it, but I think mm -hmm. that... Uh, there's a common thread in the wine world today, I think, where people are kind of trying to find that balance more than ever. For sure. What I, what I see now more than ever is a trend towards um, fresher wines with a little brighter acidity and slightly lower alcohol. And yeah, I, 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 I think that's a very wise move uh, just for the wine, for the ageability. Uh, but it's one of those things where, you know, I have tried wines that are 15.5 alcohol that still have achieved balance that have integrated flavors all the way through that uh, you know there's one thing that necessarily doesn't stick out everything is still seamless um very hedonistic wines uh yeah. they serve a purpose uh but it's one of those things where um i, I think as americans specifically uh will continue to find wine i think they'll find uh, greater pleasure in wines that have more acidity that are brighter and fresher uh, because they will ultimately pair with food better. And I think that's part of uh, some of America's problem with understanding wine is we like to think of this as the entree, not as an accoutrement to the entree. Sure. Where we're just focused on this and we're just drinking wine. Where, you know, I once made the mistake when I was in um, Siena in Italy, right? Well, I was in the town square and I ordered a bottle of wine because I wanted to drink a bottle of wine and look at this beautiful piazza um, and it was just stunning and the waiter looked at me like a, a bottle of wine he's like yeah I'll, I'll, I'll do this one and he kind of kind of huffed away and came back you know about five minutes later with the bottle but also with a little plate of food and I was like I, did, I didn't order this and he goes in Italy food and wine goes together and yeah like, of course my mistake I will gladly enjoy this and it was it's one of those things where it's it's synergistic, uh, the effects of the wine and the food together. It it takes it to another level, and I, I think once people begin to understand uh, how wine and food interact to create something ultimately better than than the separate parts, I, I think wine uh, will will be more enjoyed, uh, and ultimately that that would uh, take the wine having a touch more acidity and freshness. So it pairs with the fattiness and the richness of, of, of food, whatever you're eating. So, yeah. Agreed. Cool. Uh, anything else, uh, anything else you want us to talk about, about the, uh, the first wine before we move on to the second? Uh, paired for me. Yeah. You know, um, it, it is, you know, Bob's our guiding light. 
you know, as a human being. And Parada for me is our guiding light as a wine. It's, uh, we, we kind of use it as a gauge for our success every year. Um, kind of how we, how we craft that wine and our success with it is kind of how we, we gauge our success. And, and that's why I just wanted to, uh, I kind of, I, I mentioned it, but I wanted to reiterate, we, we spend about half of our time making Parada for me. It's, it's pretty special to us. If, if we didn't, uh, I'd probably be the wrong person to be here because uh, <laughs> it's always got to be our, it's always got to be our guiding light and we take it uh, very seriously. We probably have the most fun with it and we, we probably learn the most uh, with it as well because we have so many different lots that go into it that we get to kind of do so much experimentation with every year. It's, uh, it, it's sure. the biggest challenge and it's also the most rewarding wine that we make. For sure. I would imagine that uh, being able to pull from all the different um, you know, sub AVAs in the Columbia Valley uh, to find exactly what the bottling needs for that vintage is uh, incredibly rewarding, but it's part of the challenge as well. It's like you have it to is. chase, you've got to chase it until you find it. And once you find it, you're like, thank God, now I can take a rest. And <laughs> that is, and that is a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like it. Awesome. So let's go ahead and move on to the next Cabernet. This is the 2016 Heart of the Hill coming from Red Mountain. Bam, 16 Heart of the Hill. <laughs> awesome. Uh, if you go ahead and uh, Go ahead and uh, describe why you chose this wine to taste today. Yeah, so again, I wanted to highlight this uh, 2016 vintage, particularly with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, because I, I think it's, uh, it's an exceptional vintage for Washington. I already mentioned that, of course. Um, I thought it'd be fun, for one, just to kind of try these two Cabernet Sauvignons uh, back to back. And, and, and why I, I brought out the heart of the hill is because, you know, long before Bob was making wine, he was uh, paying a lot of attention to the different areas of Washington state and the, the quality of grapes, uh, the quality of wines that were coming out of there. So by the time he started, he, he had a pretty good idea of what he wanted to do for Paired of Me, which is really kind of cast a wide net, focus on diversity. And I think that, I think that served him well. I think that served uh, the winery well. But, you know, inside of that framework, I guess you could say, Bob was always looking for somewhere that, that could produce Cabernet that he felt uh, would really show sense of place that we could bottle, from, he could bottle from a single vineyard, we could bottle from a, a single vineyard. And uh, Heart of the Hill is kind of special to me because it had been a couple seasons, you know, I think Bob had first started working with Heart of the Hill Vineyard on Red Mountain in 2009. So by the time I came back in uh, 2014, uh, Bob, Steve, Bridget, the whole team, everybody had been kind of having this conversation about uh, sourcing Cabernet from, from Heart of the Hill. And so the, the idea predates me coming back to Betts, but luckily I got to be involved with the first vintage, which was 2014, which was my first vintage back. So I kind of got to see it go from uh, hearing about a couple years of tasting, getting to taste the 13s in barrel, uh, some of the 12s in barrel, and then getting to kind of bottle the first or blend the first, bottle the first, um, uh, vintage of Heart of the Hill Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's been fun because I've got to kind of see it from its inception. Um, and, and, you know, now it's, uh, it, it, it's well, it's five vintages later um, as far as uh, crushed vintages go. But um, mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really cool kind of juxtaposition contrast to Pair de Femme, where Pair sure. de Femme is hopefully showing off the vintage every year, which I, I, I kind of explained. I think Heart of the Hill does that too. But I think Heart of the Hill is showing off Cabernet in this very specific place. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a very different thing to Pair de Femme. Pair de Femme, we're looking for, of course, ageability, finesse, elegance, you know, all those things. I think with Heart of the Hill, we, are, you know, being that we're just making it from Cabernet Sauvignon, we're inherently looking for more power there. We're looking for more kind of generosity up front too, because uh, one of the reasons I think Bob's always blended in other grapes uh, in the beginning, Cabernet Franc was involved with Père de Femme and Merlot and Petit Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. not, not to take anything away, but it's a little easier to make a wine that's full and is very complex in flavor and things. When you get to work with kind of a, a broader range of grapes, it's, it's a little more difficult to just take Cabernet Sauvignon and bottle it. Again, that's, it's my perspective on it, but you, you've probably heard or know like the common uh, the thing people say about Cabernet, which it kind of has that donut hole in the middle of it on the palate, you know, when you, or you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I can see it sometimes where Cabernet Sauvignon by itself, it can be very big in the front and very big in the back. And it kind of, it doesn't quite have that mid palate. Merlot and Petit Verdot work so well for that. And so I think it's been exciting for us to year after year since 2014, to be able to um, kind of find what we're looking for with Heart of the Hill Cabernet Sauvignon, as far as it kind of has that texture, that precision, 
um, that density, early approachability that we kind of like want to celebrate out of just a single site uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. And yeah. again, uh, a lot of higher elevation sites in our Columbia Valley, Yakima Valley go into paired with me. Heart of the Hill, you know, being on Red Mountain, it's uh, oh, 700 to 900 feet elevation, faces mm -hmm. south and west uh, at various blocks face a, a little different or a little steeper or flatter, but um, you know, it gets plenty of heat accumulation facing south and west. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty warm site. And so uh, it's, it's, it's really been a lot of fun to get to kind of explore these different parcels because again, I'm, I'm talking about it as it's a single vineyard that uh, Scott Williams uh, owns and farms, but in reality, it's several different parcels. So each year we get to kind of, we, we've kind of have an increasing kind of collection of different blocks in there in this one thin strip of vineyard. So each season we might say, oh, clone two on block 13 did a little better. Let's, let's kind of base the wine around that. So we get to kind of play around in there and, and it gives us a little more flexibility every year. So again, you know, we are taking a little bit of Paradis for me mentality, Bob Betts mentality into uh, diversifying our, you know, how we source it. But it, it's been fun. I think, I don't know, uh, you know, tasting these two side by side, what you think about the difference of them. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting. As you said, uh, you know, the Paradis for me uh, has the, the house style of what Betts is. Like you can see the intention with, with clarity exactly what, where all the other uh, bottlings will kind of fall within the kind of frame of winemaking. You get to the heart of the hill, and it really shows that regionality of Red Mountain, where Red Mountain, when you, I think it's fairly easy to pick out in a blind tasting, just because it has that kind of mineral rigidity right in the center, mm -hmm. where it, it starts off a little almost gritty up front, but it ends up being slightly silky and end up, ends up being slightly spicy and has a kind of tannic kick at the back end that kind of loops everything together okay um where there with the heart of the hill it has um a lot more complexity to it and there is like this tighter grip where i feel that the heart of the hill is going to last um longer and age age uh, age uh, longer than the uh, the period for me um but tasting the uh, the heart of the hill the Cabernet, most Cab from Red Mountain has the ability to overripe, overripen, and okay. kick up those tannins just a touch too much. Okay. Um, where I think you have you've have everything dialed in with this, where it's more generous in style than the Paired for Me, but the Heart of the Hill has greater complexity, and there's more layers to it down. Yeah. And they, it's, it continues to evolve uh, on the palate uh, long after I've taken a sip. And it still is making me salivate, which is it's a good thing. It, literally, it's making me want to take another sip or have food. You know, so I I could totally see this with with a beautiful you know, char grilled steak. I'd I'd be happy happy camper if, if uh, I were the <laughs> Yeah, well, I can confirm that that combination works quite well. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, how do you see uh, Red Mountain gaining more notoriety in the future? Yeah, you know, that, that's a good question. Because um, I know in Washington State, certainly in, in our neck of the woods, um, we, uh, I think Red Mountain's had a reputation for, for a couple decades for, for quality wine. Longer than that, really. But I think in this kind of modern area of, of one, era of winemaking uh, in, in our part of the world up on the, on the West Coast and the Northwest, um, I think Red Mountain, there's been a buzz about it for, for some time. But certainly there's, you know, I think that I could say this same kind of, analogy about Washington State, which is the best is yet to come, if you will. Um, so many of the plantings that we work with, like for instance, the oldest planting of, on Heart of the Hill is 2006, actually. So we're all, we're really talking about pretty young vines, which is sure. kind of amazing that we can get that quality. You know, in my opinion, it's, it's pretty amazing we're able to get that quality. Um, I, I think it's going to be uh, time, understanding the sites better, understanding the farming better, Certainly, uh, Scott, we're a huge fan of what he does uh, at Heart of the Hill and Kiona. Uh, Ryan Johnson, planting uh, Weather Eye Vineyard on the top of Red Mountain, you know, yep. high elevation Syrah up at, you know, 1,000, 11, 1,200 feet um, and beyond up there. Um, a, a bunch of different grape types. And I, and I think, uh, you know, maybe the, what I just said, grape types, may, maybe that's going to be uh, a direction Washington goes to before it finally kind of is known for one grape or two grapes or three grapes and kind of a style. I think that's one of the things that's interesting about Washington State is 
versus I think Napa Valley. Like um, if you buy a bottle of Cabernet um, from uh, Rutherford, you know, this is a generalization, but I think that there is, uh, there's a predictable character that you're going to get. There's a lot of stylistic diversity with plenty sure. of different winemakers, but I think it's a little more predictable in what you're going to get stylistically. I think uh, going back, kind of circling back to what you said, asked about Red Mountain, I think that it's Washington State, Red Mountain's included in that. I think it's going to be a matter of, you know, people understanding the sites more, getting a, kind of a better vantage point of uh, how fermentation techniques work, how farming techniques work, um, how cellaring techniques work. And, um, you know, at, at some point, I, I would like to think that we're going to see a, not less stylistic diversity, but a little more predictability out of when people go to buy a bottle of Washington State Cabernet, they're going to say, that's what Yakima Valley sh it tastes like. That is what, um, you know, Heart of the Hill Cabernet or Red Mountain Cabernet tastes like. And, and it's great. I love the experimentation we have. There's so many different styles. I mean, you look at like Quilcita Creek, they do amazing, powerful wine. And then there's other people on the other end that do more subtle uh, versions of that. But um, I think that that's going to be one of the things that's going to be important for Washington State is, of course, you have producers like Cayuse. Their Syrahs are just like from Mars, unbelievable. But <laughs> they're kind of at this one end of the spectrum, right? So I think yeah. that it's going to be a matter of enough people um, kind of setting down or going after a certain style and kind of people being able to uh, recognize, wow, that's what Washington Syrah tastes like. And not to say there can't be diversity, but I, I think that's one of the things that it's going to take for Red Mountain to be known is more people out there, more experimentation, more time, more, more cause and effect, better vantage points. For sure. Yeah, it's one of the, uh, one of the points I made with uh, the last, or with, with the uh, report that I did at Washington for the 2017s. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the very last pictures of the report was a black and white um, photo uh, from Google Earth taken, I think it was in, I think it was 20 years apart, roughly. And you could see how much has happened in just those 20 years. Yep. And there still continues to be uh, new plantings happening. Um, and it's just, it's, it's really interesting. I, I had the thought of Red Mountain is, is considerably, it's, it's, just, it's the smallest AVA it's in, in Washington. It's very, mm -hmm. very tiny compared to um, other, other areas. But I thought between the typicity of all the different Cabernets and vineyards from, you know, Cabernet Vineyard, from Heart of the Hill, um, from all these different, different plots, there is, I think, enough typicity to uh, garner a, um, a, a sub-AVA. You could make sub, basically uh, subdivide Red, uh, um, Red Mountain into smaller AVAs that basically work on typicity of what the soil type and the uh, flavor profile is giving you from, from those vineyards. Bob's, Bob's has the same sentiment. He's, 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 those exact words have, uh, has, have come from his mouth many times. So uh, it, it's a, Bob, Bob shares that with you. I, I, I'm okay. somewhere in there as well. I, yeah. I think that, that we'll reach a point in time where we know enough about it, where, where those lines will be drawn. For sure. The, the only thing is, is it's gonna become more confusing because no one will know what these, uh, what these sub AVs are. They're, they're gonna know the bigger Red yes. Mountain AVA. So <laughs> then there's that branding <laughs> issue. Yep. Mm -hmm. that challenge as well. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but at the same time, it puts more focus on quality over time, which I think is, is the right move for Red Mountain in Washington State. Yeah, and the uniqueness of sight and distinction and expression. And it's out there. We're still learning it. We're, it's so new. So many of our, our I guess, best performing sites are, are, have been planted since the year 2000. I mean, yes, we have some amazing, uh, you know, for us old blocks, uh, you know, 1990 Red Willow Merlot and 1992 De Brule Merlot and 1986 Red Willow Vineyard uh, Syrah. But, uh, and those are amazing sites, but still there's so much stuff that is, you know, less than 20 years old that we get a lot of our best fruit from. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, Heart of the Hill being only first planted in 06 and we were, Bob was only working with it since 2009. So I, I think that's one of the things every morning when I get up to, I'm like, wow, there's so much discovery uh, ahead for us and there's just so much to learn about it i think it's just going to tell a lot of people working really hard at it to uh sure. to kind of refine it for sure i i still think that there are still plots of land that you have uh, have yet to be planted and discovered that will 
uh, ultimately rival uh, some of the, uh, the greatest sites in Washington State and make a name for themselves still. But um, yeah, there's, there's nothing but discovery still for, uh, for Washington State and it has a very bright future. Uh, anything else you'd like to uh, conclude with, uh, with Heart of the Hill before we move on to the last one? Nope, nope. I think I think we covered it. It's uh, again, it's we we certainly don't spend the time on it that we spend on Paradifamy because Paradifamy is just su such diverse uh, diverse uh, sourcing. But um, it's almost an easier wine to put together. We have a, a few lots from the different uh, parcels, and it's usually pretty clear to us, pretty easy. But you know, we we have a lot of fun doing it, and it's it's really enjoyable to have that juxtaposition to where say, okay, this is, this is uh, 2016 from the greater Columbia Valley or Yakima Valley. And this is 2016 cab from a single site. So it, it's, a, that one's a lot of fun for us. So I'm just watching my reflection uh, on the video and it, I, I, I tend to do this with, with Red Mountain wines where like after I you know, sip them or swallow them, it's almost a wine that you almost end up chewing. You're like, mm-hmm. After, after, it's just like it's 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 powerful it's generous it's kind of grippy and it mm -hmm. just kind of hangs on the palate and the gum line um it's, it's a beautiful wine thank you so let's go on to the last wine for today this is uh the most clever uh cleverest of names <laughs> <laughs> the uh 2016 uh uh code of bets yep <laughs> yeah so um <laughs> Clo de Betts, I'll, 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 I'll talk briefly about the name. Uh, Mr. Bob Betts and Kathy Betts, they were uh, traveling in Europe in, I, I think, 1973. So this is, this is before Bob is, and Kathy are in the wine industry. And uh, they spent, oh, I think more than a year in, in Europe traveling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so they're a little younger at this point in time. And they're in Burgundy and they're, they're visiting uh, the, the famous Grand Cru, Chamberton Clo de Bez, And Bob says to Kathy, I'm going to make a wine someday and we're going to call it Clo de Betts. And, and that's, so there you go. That's in 73 and yeah. in 1997, uh, in 1997, that, that came to life. And so again, yeah. I, I talk about Paradis for me as being the genesis of Betts family winery. In reality, uh, Clo de Betts also came to life in, in 1997. But again, Cabernet has always been Bob's guiding light and it'll always be our guiding light, really Cabernet. I mean, we do other wines and we love playing with Syrah since the early 2000 and we just get yeah. such enjoyment out of it. But but Cabernet is, it, we, we, we spend the most time uh, working on Cabernet. But back to Clo de Betts. So uh, Clo de Betts okay. is, uh, in the beginning, especially in 97, it was kind of the, it was the juxtaposition to Père de Famille, which was a Cabernet Sauvignon based wine, being it's Merlot based every year. It's usually about, you know, 60, 70% Merlot. And, and Bob had been a, a fan, a proponent of Washington State Merlot, obviously since the 1970s, and, and had always wanted to get his hands on it as well. And so it, it kind of really worked out well. I think in the first year, he only bottled 45 cases. So it was a couple, couple barrels worth. But, um, you know, I think in the best instances, uh, Merlot in Washington State, it, it can often match maybe the flavor intensity of Cabernet Sauvignon, which I don't know if you can say that about Merlot uh, from every part of the world. I think um, there are certainly very high quality producers probably in every wine region of the world. And there's those that maybe aren't as profound bottles. But um, I think that in Washington State, the, the instance of Merlot being very high quality, I, you just see it a lot. I think that there's a lot. It, it's, it has been appreciated. I think there was probably more buzz about Merlot 10 years ago in Washington State than there is today. But um, certainly uh, some of the sites, we joke actually that some of the sites we get Merlot from, like De Brule Vineyard, for instance, we'll joke that, hey, that's the best, that, that's some of the best Cabernet we harvested this year. And, and we joke about that because it has flavor intensity like Cabernet Sauvignon. And uh, we source it. Again, we have Père de Famille, which is Yakima Valley, Columbia Valley, but a lot of it can be sourced from Red Mountain and kind of that eastern end of the Yakima Valley. Uh, historically, and even today, a, a, most of our Merlot tends to be sourced more toward the western end of the Yakima Valley, higher elevation sites where we're hoping to get more season, more hang time, more complexity um, out of Merlot. And again, on that, on that western end, historically, it's been Red Willow Vineyard and De Brule Vineyard and, and you know, Elephant Mountain and, and places like these. And they do, they have a, a long season. It's where we can hopefully get the most hang time out of Merlot. I mean, there have been seasons, actually last season, we, we brought some all the way out to, oh, maybe the first day of November, which is, uh, which is something to be able to hang Merlot that long because oh. if we harvest Merlot on Red Mountain, which is lower elevation, warmer Western, Southwestern aspect, 
it'll be the last days of August, the first days uh, of September, right? So it's a very different animal to uh, the Eastern end, those higher elevation sites where we can have like another three, four weeks of hang time. It really shows in the wine. Yes, both wines for us um, can be uh, compelling and weighty and complex, but I think on, on those higher elevation sites where we can just kind of find that that you know near ideal marriage of Merlot and site and, and, and heat accumulation, it can really just um, kind of gain a lot of complexity in, in its flavor profile. And so again, 70% uh, Merlot on this wine in 2016, uh, mm -hmm. the remainder the other 30% was split between Petit Verdot and Cabernet Sauvignon. And so um, I know you're tasting it right now too. I think that it, it, it really highlights that, that plum fruit and that black cherry. I like to think <laughs> of, of Merlot, but it, maybe it has a little more seriousness to it from some, a little bit of the Cabernet and Petit Verdot. Yeah. I get a little bit of like damson flower. It's, uh, I get some more floral tones on the nose mm -hmm. um, out of the bowl uh, directly. And you have um, that kind of firm backbone that kind of that, that what the Petit Verdot adds to, uh, to uh, something like Merlot. But overall, the epitome of what this wine is telling me is, is it's plummy uh, with hints of sage, the kind of slight rustic uh, minerality to it with like this kind of purple red floral tone underneath. And uh, that to me is quintessential Merlot. Uh, on the palate though, through the, through the mid palate, there's like this lift that gives a little bit, like a little more kind of beefiness, uh -huh. uh, has, has a strength to it that Merlot typically doesn't have. And I think it's because of the other 30% that's been blended to give a little bit more structure. Uh -huh. um, but it's, I, I think it's the most floral of the three. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful one. Yeah, wine. you know, I think uh, one thing to, to note in there, um, the 16 Paire de Femme has actually 20% uh, Petit Verdot in it, and the 2016 okay. Clos de Betz has 15%. Uh, and I know I already said that about Clos de Betz. Mm -hmm. uh, Petit Verdot is a grape that Bob has long believed in, and we believe in, in, in Washington State. And mm -hmm. uh, for a very long time, Bob's been on a mission to kind of find that, that perfect site to, to farm uh, Petit Verdot. Mm -hmm. And we, we certainly have a site for Petit Verdot we're in love with, so I have to mention it. Uh, uh, northwest uh, of Red Mountain, I guess about 10 miles northwest, up on a bench at a vineyard called Olson. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about, oh, I think it's 1,100 feet elevation, pretty south-facing. Uh, steep south facing site. We get some Petit Verdot there that is, I guess stylistically, it's probably somewhere in between Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just brings a, a minerality. It's probably actually usually a softer structure than our Merlot or our Cab, I think, which surprises people. And I think mm -hmm. that Petit Verdot will surprise people in Washington state because I think people just solely think of Petit Verdot as uh, high phenolics, dark, inky, black, people use yeah. it as a small blending ingredient. I think you and I had a discussion we, about we did, yeah. kind of the expectation of Petit Verdot. And, and I think if you taste it just out of a barrel in our cellar from, from a couple different sites, but Olson Vineyard in particular, you'll see, wow, it's all about flowers. And I think Bob's described it as almost maybe stony or gravel, you know, kind of those, those descriptors where it does, mm -hmm. it adds a, it adds a vein of mer minerality when we mm -hmm. have it at the blending table. And it's just, you know, that freshness, that minerality is always something that we're seeking, searching for. So it's been kind of this, uh, this really cool tool for us to have at the blending table. So we, we can't say enough good things about uh, Petit Verdot and shout out to Leif Olson as Petit Verdot is, is pretty darn good. Petit Verdot, I think, has that tendency to make too much of an imprint on a wine, uh, being overly tannic, overly inky, uh, almost one dimensional. It's like it's the hammer. It's, no, it's the sledgehammer. Yep. It's the bulldozer. And yeah. it's just like it weighs on the palate. It sits there like a tongue depressor. Yep. Um, and I have had Petit Verdot's um, that through whatever kind of sorcery or magic uh, have managed to pull out all the aromatics and give a softer expression so it's not just so uh, blunt on, on yeah. the palate. And um, when, when you came to visit at the office, um, I was just flabbergasted about when you said it was 15... Um, percent for for the one blend and I was like this feels like it's like five seven and like that's just what the site does that's how we do it is like that's brilliant don't ever change that because it's, it's good thank you um, so speaking about sites and soils um, what are your thoughts on how Washington producers can make 
better wine uh, in regards to their soil types uh, and their varietals planted in, in their soil types? Yeah, you know, I think that the answer that I'm going to give you, you'll, you'll, you, it's predictable in a way. I think that you won't be surprised. Um, I think I could say this about many different aspects of, of washing and wine. And again, I, I am pretty partial to experimentation and always trying to, like I've mentioned numerous times, I'm always trying to get a better vantage point on kind of how cellar techniques work for us, how different sites uh, respond to, to farming, crop load, canopy, um, how, how wines and cuvées evolve in the barrel, uh, the, the barrels we use, you know, all those things, this, this feedback loop that we have, like, I feel like it's just critical. And when you're talking about, I think from a 40,000 foot level in Washington state, um, if you walk up to a site in Washington, particularly because people do talk about the diversity of soils we have, they talk about the Missoula floodline, how there's kind of ancient soils above it and uh, newer uh, soils deposited after it and windblown lows and things. I think mechanically it can work uh, in a very similar way, just like the mechanics of it, unless you're like out on the edge of the blue mountains where you can dry farm, most of us are using, um, most of us are using drip irrigation. So I think that, you know, like you had said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of probably ground. I know there's a lot of ground that has not been planted yet that is gonna produce really compelling wines. But I think that the ground we already have planted, I think it takes a lot of effort just to go, to really understand it better. And yeah. if, if it's a hundred acre track you're talking about, well, where are the sweet spots in it? And how can we farm those to best, uh, for lack of a better word, exploit, like the best quality we can from those or really just uh, make those show a character that no one's seen yet. And I think that that is, that is the huge challenge, the difficulty, but it's also probably where the most potential, where the most reward lies in Washington State. Right. Again, this is from my advantage. This is from my perspective. But I think, you know, just being back at Vets for six years and seeing the diversity of quality and character we have in all the sites that we farm, a lot of sites that Bob had been farming, because we do have a lot of sites that are very historic that have been our program for more than 20 years, which for us is, you know, a, a long time. I, I think that there is still so much work to do right there in just understanding um, our parcels, um, no matter their size. And something I, you know, a, a particular ch a challenge that's been particular to me at the, at the winemaker is, you know, something that's almost very rudimentary, which is understanding like how much crop load I can hang on, on each site. Like yeah. it, can't walk up to a site. I can't walk up to a site and say, you know what, this is going to produce great wine. Or if I harvest four tons an acre out of here, it's going to be good or one ton an acre. So I think a lot of that rudimentary stuff, and especially, I think it's, there's a challenge with a lot of us being on the Western side of the mountain range. Um, it, it can be tougher for us to really meticulously understand all this different, these different areas that are planted, the different grapes and, and, and find the potential out there. So um, I think just on a macro level that there's so much work to do. I think that we need to, we need to try to conquer down here at, 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 at this level down here before uh, we go to the next. So, um, you know, above that, I think that Washington state is, I know a lot of people have said this, so I don't want to sound cliche, but we do have a really unusual climate to grow grapes in. So there are a lot of seasons many seasons where our disease pressure will be very low. I never want to say that Washington state is the perfect place to grow grapes because a place like that doesn't exist on planet earth. So there's no perfect place to grow grapes, right? We all have different pressures um, depending on where we're growing, which grape type we're, we're working with. Um, there's, there's so much work to do there just on that level. But uh, I think the conversation, thank goodness, the conversation I think in the whole world is which is a conversation I, I wish we could have been having 20 years ago. Some people that had a little more sight could, which is like, how do we manage our resources the best we pos possibly can as far as water? How do, we, um, how do we intervene the least we can as far as like chemical usage and spray applications? And I mean, it, it, you can extrapolate it down to labor as well and all these different things. But I think, you know, uh, it's, I don't know that we're forced to look at it, but we are all forced to look at it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yes. it, it's there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a very real thing. Just, just the use of the water itself, right? I mean, yes, exactly. chemical application and sprays are, are important too. Water's right up there, right? I mean, yeah. uh, especially water we rights. Look, yeah, water. we will look very at water important. differently in, in 10 years from now, um, <laughs> no matter what, what part of agriculture you're in, the water, our conversation about water will be very different than it is uh, today, right? So you have kind of all these layers of, of complexity. And um, yeah, so again, I'm going to circle back around and say that 
we're very we're in a very unique position in Washington State that we do have um, unusually low uh, pressure from pest and disease. We still do have to, of course, be very mindful. We still have to do spray application like everywhere else in the world does. But that's kind of that, I guess that gives us a little bit of an advantage to places that just every year they have to deal with so much more than we do. And so their level of intervention and their level of um, like their spray, spray application rate and everything they have to do for pest and disease will be, uh, you know, 10x or 20x higher than what we have to do. So, but I think that has put us in this position where it's taken us a little longer to come around to that. But I think it's, it's something that's on everyone's mind. People are working harder than ever trying to understand how can we best manage those? How can we be, how can we be softest to the earth and impact the groundwater the least we can and, you know, all those things. Yeah, very thoughtful. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say uh, or have any uh, last parting thoughts for us? Um, you know, there's a lot of excitement in Washington State right now. You know, the whole world is in a very interesting uh, place right now. And I, I like to think there's going to be a lot of good to come from everything we're going through right now. I think no matter which topic you wanted to, to discuss, I think you could say, hopefully on the other end of this, uh, we're going to make progress and we're going to be the better for it. That, that is my hope and that, that is my belief. And so um, the best is yet to come uh, with Washington State. I think there's more young people that are more interested in kind of comparing and contrasting what we do to everywhere else in the world. And I think that's, that's something that really drives me is all these other, um, I say young winemakers, but just winemakers, uh, men, women, everybody, just there's so many people that are excited um, about Washington State about what we're doing and have maybe a, a broader perspective, a more global perspective on um, just kind of where we fit in, you know, stylistically, qualitatively. Um, just so many of the people I come into contact with here have such a, a broad perspective, are well-traveled. It, it really gets me excited. I like to think, uh, you know, where we are, especially with, with uh, being that I'm at Betts and working under Bob, uh, we put a lot of study into what we do. And I like to think at Best Family Winery, like every decision that I'm making, I have like a thousand people influencing me, like all these empty bottles of wine, all these winemakers <laughs> behind me, they influence me. Bob's influenced me, all the winemakers in our community around the world. So I think the more, the more of a, of a 40,000 foot view we take and the more we understand what everybody else does, it gives us a leg up in understanding what we do. Awesome. Lewis, thank you so much for, uh, for spending your Wednesday afternoon with me. Uh, great to talk to you. Great to see you. Hope you're doing well. And I look forward to getting back out to Washington and, uh, and uh, hanging out with uh, you and Bob and everyone at the, uh, the winery, tasting, uh, tasting through some wonderful wines. So uh, until then, next Wednesday, we have uh, Crystal de Creek, uh, which uh, Alex Stewart will be joining me. So uh, set your calendar for that. Until Very then, cool. stay safe, drink well, and be kind to others. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you, Anthony. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.